History's great strategic thinkers show us that we can prepare ourselves for most any challenge. But first, we begin with a famous caveat. In the year 1789, Benjamin Franklin wrote the following in a letter. Our new constitution is now established and has an appearance that promises permanency. But in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. Now, given everything we know now about strategy, from Sun Tzu to Clausewitz to how our brains work, let's add one more thing to Franklin's very short list. Nothing can be said to be certain except death, taxes, and uncertainty. Uncertainty plagues us. It's everywhere, in our professional lives and in our personal lives. It's tough to read the signals coming in, whether from other persons in close relationships, to our coworkers, to our seniors and subordinates, to our competitors in other firms, on other teams. Throughout these lectures, we have emphasized this battle with uncertainty about, about the future and how to deal with it. But the measure of our success is not whether we can predict the future, it's how prudently we prepare for it. It's how we coolly disaggregate the churning morass of possibilities that cascade on us and make us want to throw up our hands in frustration. We cannot predict the future, not even our own future. But we've seen that we really don't need to. By adopting various combinations of strategic thinking techniques and tools of analysis, and by seizing a substantial role in developing our circumstances, we can improve our chances of succeeding at the tasks we set for ourselves. We can successfully alter the conditions that affect the future that concerns us in our personal lives, as well as in the professional realm. I tell my students that strategy is a plan of where we want to go based on an analysis of where we've been, where we are, and what resources we'll need to make the trip. On a personal level, it's a plan based on what's in here and what's out there. Of course, it's much more than that, but that simple trope keeps us focused on the essentials. It's enough to get our heads up out of the mundane daily tasks that absorb us. In these lectures, we've discussed a full range of strategic thinking skills valuable for any strategic thinker. Now, let's look at how a few exemplary human beings have lived strategic lives, creating opportunities, seizing them, charting a course that is not free from failure, but with a trajectory that is ever upward. This final lecture offers several strategic thinkers who exemplify how to live a life informed by strategy, informed by principle, forward-looking thinkers who were also steeped in the past, who possessed what we might call a strategic imagination. One early American who practiced the art of strategic thinking on a superior level that has rarely been matched was Benjamin Franklin. Visualizing the future and crafting that future, shaping it, manipulating it, acting in ways to maximize a productive relationship to his environment. Franklin was, of course, a man of extreme talent. He was an autodidact, self-educated. Living his life completely within the 18th century, he was a man greatly influenced by the Enlightenment. He counted Voltaire among his acquaintances. And this made him a man for all times, speaking with a voice armed with principles. It was Franklin's vision, coupled with an equally determined drive, that led him to press forward his entire life. It's this pressing forward that characterizes so many great personages. He grew. He prospered. He adapted to his environment, seizing opportunities and creating them as well. When he wanted to get started in the Philadelphia printing business, he convinced the governor of Pennsylvania to send him to London to study printing technology. In return, he offered to provide the governor with better printed documents as a result of his study trip. This adaptability served him throughout his life, and he lived that life in the most strategic manner conceivable. His personal entrepreneurial philosophy was typical of the great strategic thinkers of history. It was captured in this famous epigram. If you would not be forgotten as soon as you are dead and rotten, either write things worth reading or do things worth the writing. Franklin exhibited the strategic personality's thirst for knowledge and ideas. When he was only 21, he created a group to discuss scientific and political ideas, which later evolved into the American Philosophical Society. Franklin and his associates founded the first public library in America in 1731. In 1749, he launched an initiative to found what would become later 
the University of Pennsylvania. He contributed to the text of the Declaration of Independence, and during the Revolutionary War years, he served as leader of a commission to seek support from France. He was the toast of Europe and carefully managed a personal brand that established the stereotype of American rustic genius. We've noted how important the game of chess is as a training device for strategic thinking. Franklin was a chess player. In fact, he was the first person in America that we know by name as a chess player. He was such a great admirer of this elegant game that he even wrote an article called The Morals of Chess. In short, Franklin shared with most strategic thinkers a curiosity combined with a lust for life. He put himself into the mainstream. He was always powerfully engaged with his environment, never on the metaphorical sidelines. He left us legacies in a half a dozen fields, any one of which would be enough to ensure his place in history. In science, in politics, education, in literature, in military affairs, in business and in finance. The good news for us today is that the secret of his success was really no secret at all. Franklin lived his life by a set of principles that maximized his natural gifts. Franklin developed his own strategic plan, a list of 13 principles. These were not merely notions of how to live the good life, but a blueprint for a robust and future-oriented existence, the seizing of opportunities, and the creation of others. The test of his principles are their continued applicability in the present. While all 13 of these virtues are surely worthy of consideration and of your own pursuit, if only for historical interest, four of them immediately yearn for our attention. Order. Let all your things have their places. Let each part of your business have its time. Resolution. Resolve to perform what you ought. Perform without fail what you resolve. Frugality. Make no expense but to do good to others or yourself. Waste nothing. And finally, industry. Lose no time. Be always employed in something useful. Cut off all unnecessary actions. These four guiding principles suggest to us that one key to tackling the uncertainty that surrounds us is to establish an island of certitude in the midst of uncertainty. The world may be uncertain, but that is no need for us to share in that uncertainty. Indeed, the very nation and constitution that Benjamin Franklin did so much to help establish depended vitally on strategic thinking skills that Franklin and others had cultivated across an entire lifetime. Another man with a fabulously strategic mind who strode the first half of the 20th century like a giant was Sir Winston Churchill. Churchill is best known for his role as Britain's Prime Minister during the darkest days of World War II, when England stood alone against Nazi Germany. His personal courage, his resolve, and his powerful rhetoric inspired the resistance of the nation. But this was just one chapter in the life of one of the most extraordinary strategic minds of any century, for Churchill lived life as large as anyone in history and had the knack of being on the scene of great events. This knack was the result of his personal drive that moved him constantly from the periphery into the mainstream of life, where great things happen. This alone is a lesson to the rest of us. The lesson is to engage, to move into the mainstream, where access to collateral possibilities make themselves known to us. Churchill lived a rich life, outstripping that of any epic fictional character. Churchill's extraordinary exploits began much earlier and were born of an incredible drive. His father died at the young age of 45, and Churchill believed that he too would die young. He would have to move fast to establish a legacy worth leaving. It was perhaps this sense of urgency, above all else, that drove Churchill his entire life. And this urgency is evident in his thirst for battle, for courage testing trials, for confrontation. In 1895, Churchill became a war correspondent, and he traveled to Cuba to observe the Spanish fight the Cuban guerrillas and to write about the daily conflict for the Daily Graphic. It's there that he cultivated a lifelong penchant for Cuban cigars at age 21. He obtained a commission in the army and immediately did what any good strategist ought to. He put himself into the mainstream albeit an extremely dangerous version of the mainstream. He sought the riskiest assignments. He served in British India, 
the Sudan and the Second Boer War. While in the Sudan, serving as a cavalryman with the 21st Lancers, he participated in the last great British cavalry charge at the Battle of Omdurman in September 1898. Then he was off to South Africa. Churchill sought assignment in South Africa in October 1899, where the British were fighting the Boers, and in the space of just eight months, Churchill lived larger than most people live in a lifetime. As a correspondent, he accompanied a scouting expedition in an armored train, which led to his capture by the Boers. But he escaped from his prison camp located in Pretoria. He immediately rejoined the British Army, and as a commissioned officer in the South African Light Horse, he helped to relieve the British at the Siege of Ladysmith, and then capture the city of Pretoria. Churchill returned to Britain, and his political star rose until he reached the lofty post of First Lord of the Admiralty in 1911, three years before the start of World War I. Churchill crafted a strategy in that war to relieve the pressure on the Western Front that was stalemated in trench warfare. He pushed hard for the 1915 invasion of the Turkish Gallipoli Peninsula to seize control of the Dardanelles Strait. He envisioned it as a quick surprise stroke, but bungling execution of the plan led to a disaster. It seemed that Churchill was the only one who understood the importance of strategic surprise. The Gallipoli invasion and subsequent six months of trench warfare ended in an ignominious British withdrawal in late 1915. The Dardanelles became synonymous with fiasco and recklessness. It scarred Churchill's reputation, and he was cashiered from his position in the Admiralty. He was shuffled off to a ceremonial job. Now, a lesser man might have been content to settle, but Churchill's relentless drive, his strategic intent, led him to begin his own reconstruction. It required a major change, a 90-degree turn from his political course. He emerged from the Dardanelles catastrophe with his lesson learned, what he called the five distinct truths governing decisions about military operations. These principles can be applied to strategic decision-making in most any enterprise. These five principles are, one, one must have full authority. Two, there is a reasonable prospect of success. Three, greater interests are not compromised. Four, all possible care and forethought are exercised in the preparation. And five, all vigor and determination are shown in the execution. The first dictum was the lesson he clung to most fervently. He absolutely rebelled against accepting responsibilities without the necessary power of effective action to achieve the desired results. Lessons in hand, he knew that he had to refurbish his reputation if he expected to continue making his mark in public affairs, so he did the one thing that was in character for him. It would also bring him back from political exile. In early 1916, Churchill sought to join the battle on the Western Front. He became a battalion commander of the 6th Battalion of the Royal Scots Fusiliers. His time at the front was brief, but he earned the respect of his officers and men. Churchill returned to government in various administrative posts as Minister of Munitions, Secretary of State for War, Secretary of State for Air. After the war, Churchill served as Chancellor of the Exchequer in the Conservative government of 1924-29. to and then, with that uncanny knack for being on the scene of great events, he traveled to the United States on a speaking tour at a critical time in history. He took his one and only trip to Wall Street to visit the New York Stock Exchange. He was in the gallery on the morning of Thursday, October 24th, 1929, when the New York stock market went into free fall. He had come to see how his American investments were faring. Not very well, it seems. Through the 1930s, Winston thought, and he wrote, and he engaged at the periphery of politics so as to prepare for an eventual comeback, until on May 10, 1940, he became Prime Minister, even as France teetered on the brink of defeat and the Battle of Britain was soon to commence. He guided Britain through four years of war, and in that time he earned a reputation as a crafty leader, enamored of surprise and of deception. He relished that he was privy to the most secret transmissions of the German enemy through the magic of the ultra-secret, the decoding of secret enemy radio traffic. 
In the end, he gave Britain victory, and he, he was rewarded with election defeat. The British people thought that their wartime leader wasn't the man to lead them in the subsequent peace. And it seemed, finally, the end to an amazing political, military, administrative, and journalistic career that had spanned five decades. For most larger-than-life characters, guiding his country through the greatest crisis in its history would have been more than enough. But there seemed no end to Sir Winston's resilience. He again became Prime Minister in 1951. It seemed that he would finally leave politics on his own terms, and he ultimately did when he retired in 1955. Throughout his life, Winston Churchill sought adventure. A more sober way of looking at it was his desire to place himself in the mainstream of events, where adventures are launched, where opportunities abound, where there is more to life than simple mundane things that, that just happen to you. He never settled for the tributaries of life, where every day is like every other day. It's no coincidence that he shared with Benjamin Franklin a passion for study. Churchill absorbed information voraciously. He deliberated intensely. He especially valued history, the wisdom of the ages, as an indispensable guide for the future. In Churchill's words, the longer you look back, the farther you can look forward. Churchill's universal embrace of the past as prologue is what catalyzed his decision making. The British historian Sir John H. Plum characterized Churchill's historical imagination this way. History, for Churchill, was not a subject like geography or mathematics. It was a part of his temperament. It permeated everything he touched, and it was the mainspring of his politics and the secret of his immense mastery. History, learning, accumulated experience all served as the expanding platform from which thinkers like Franklin and Churchill would launch their grand notions. It allowed them to confront reality Confronting reality is a Churchillian way of doing business. He recognized that simply having a good idea just isn't good enough, not by any stretch. It takes imagination, sure, but it also takes boldness, decisiveness, and relentless follow-through. Don't think that the opposition rolled over for Winston Churchill just because he was Churchill. Churchill himself offered blood, toil, sweat, and tears in all of his ventures. During the World War I period, he wrote this, Most great exploits have to be conducted under conditions of peculiar difficulty and discouragement. How easy to do nothing. How hard to achieve anything. There are plenty of good ideas if only they can be backed with power and brought into reality. These were extraordinary people who lived during interesting times. These were men who chose to be great by their thinking, their actions, we read about them because they were strategic thinkers who confronted reality, wrestled with it, and, if not always victorious, came out on top more often than not. We're all capable of shaping destinies in like fashion, perhaps not the destinies of nations, but surely our own, and perhaps the destiny of our own company. How do we do this? By seeing, and by thinking, and by planning. Boldness, decisiveness, and relentless follow-through. Now there's a pattern here, and the great strategic thinkers of history anticipate this pattern. Think of Churchill's remark about how difficult it is to get things done. How easy to do nothing, how hard to achieve anything. One person who understood this perhaps better than anyone in the business in the early 21st century is Steve Jobs. We think of Steve Jobs in many ways, entrepreneur, Media mogul, shrewd businessman, techno artist, public relations master, presentation expert, family man, authoritarian, maniacally focused, opinionated. And Steve Jobs demonstrated characteristics of a great strategist, a man who possessed kudoi, the blinding flash of insight at the crucial moment, and who exercised it with aplomb and relentless effectiveness. Like Churchill, Steve Jobs had reinvented himself again and again. His triumphant return to lead Apple in 1997, in fact, was not unlike Churchill's return as Prime Minister of England in 1951. Like only a handful of persons in history, Steve Jobs transformed the world. His vision, his determination, and his strategic execution revolutionized six industries, personal computers, 
animated movies, music, phones, tablet computing, and digital publishing. Steve transformed the way we entertain ourselves, the way we communicate, the way we think about how we live our lives. He transformed our expectations about life, and he inspired us to think strategically. Perhaps his most famous ad campaign was the exhortation for us to think different. That's like a mission statement for any strategy. Think differently. Steve Jobs was a strategic thinker of the first rank. He not only conjured visions of how we might do things differently, he solidified those visions into strategic intent, an obsession with winning, and he executed tactics brilliant, brilliantly to bring those visions into being, time and time again. That's what made him such a success as a serial entrepreneur. Steve Jobs' career resembled that of Winston Churchill. He clashed often with his contemporaries. He saw his fortunes wax, then wane, then wax again. In fact, he could have faded away after any one of several professional disasters that would have left a lesser personality devastated. In 1985, he was forced out of Apple, the company he had co-founded. But he then quickly purchased a small animation and computer company from filmmaker George Lucas for $5 million, and he invested an additional $5 million of his own money. He became chairman and CEO of the company. The company was renamed Pixar, and Jobs began repositioning the company. Simultaneous with the Pixar deal, Steve continued his computer ventures by founding another computer platform development company called Next. Next had only mixed success, but both Next and Pixar anchored Steve in the high technology field. They served as important platform for his continued interactions with major corporations such as IBM, Microsoft, and Walt Disney. Then, the mid-1990s saw what appeared as the re-emergence of Steve Jobs, even his reincarnation. Under Jobs, Pixar had transformed itself from a high-end computer maker to a creator of feature-length animated films. And in 1995, it released its first blockbuster, Toy Story which grossed more than $350 million worldwide. In 1996, Apple Computer bought Next, and it brought Steve back to the company he had co-founded 20 years earlier. Apple had declined in the intervening years, however. In fact, it was a company adrift. It produced a bewildering welter of computer models for no good reason that Steve could figure out. So he asserted himself. He managed to oust CEO Gilamelio. He immediately recharted Apple's strategic course. He cut the payroll, and he got Apple out of the printer and server businesses. He slashed the number of different Apple computers by 70%. As Jobs would later say, deciding what not to do is as important as deciding what to do. That's true for companies, and it's true for products. He brought focus and excitement back to the company. After one meeting in 1997, Jobs said this, I came out of the meeting with people who had just gotten their products canceled, and they were three feet off the ground with excitement because they finally understood where in the heck we were going. In a dramatic demonstration of Kudoy, Steve redirected Apple's strategy in a single meeting, simplifying and riveting the focus of the company. On a whiteboard, he drew a diagram, a matrix with four quadrants, the columns were labeled consumer and pro. The rows were labeled desktop and portable. The engineer's task was to create four products, one for each quadrant. Former Apple employee Phil Schiller says that the effect of this simplified strategy was electrifying. Quote, the result was that the Apple engineers and managers suddenly became sharply focused on just four areas. Interestingly, interestingly the board of Apple never voted on whether to approve the new strategy. Steve just forged ahead. And the resulting products were the Power Macintosh G3, the PowerBook G3, the iMac, and the iBook. The pro users got the Power Macintosh and PowerBook. Consumers got iBrand products, which started with the iMac and the iBook. And at the same time, he laid plans to transform Apple into something new, something different. So he set his engineers in search of the next big thing. That next big thing, which arrived in stores just two years later, turned out to be the iPod, the device that transformed the music industry. And the larger strategy was even more breathtaking. Biographer Walter Isaacson 
put it this way. Jobs launched a new grand strategy that would transform Apple, and with it, the entire technology industry. Apple would no longer be just a computer company. Indeed, it would drop that word from its name. But the Macintosh would be reinvigorated by becoming the hub for an astounding array of new gadgets. These new gadgets included the iPod and iTunes in 2001, the iPhone in 2007, and the iPad in 2010. And the new gadgets worked seamlessly with one another, creating a ratchet effect. Each new Apple product could stand on the shoulders of previous Apple products. The strategy worked. And the business result was that Apple turned around completely and began a phenomenal run of innovation and prosperity. In May 2000, Apple's market value was 1 20th that of Microsoft. Ten years later, Apple surpassed Microsoft as the world's most valuable technology company. And by late 2011, it exceeded Microsoft's value by more than 70%. In all of this, Steve Jobs exhibited traits of the master strategist. Focus, strategic intent, relentless determination and drive, brilliant insight at the crucial moment, carefully coordinated use of surprise at the launch of a new product, use of and precise execution of his strategy and detailed follow-through. He is an iconic figure and his impact, like our other exemplars of strategy, will likely continue for decades. Benjamin Franklin, Napoleon, Winston Churchill, John Kennedy, Vince Lombardi, Martin Luther King, Steve Jobs. These strategic thinkers serve as exemplars across the professions. They demonstrate the power of a great strategy, well executed, in the face of titanic challenges. In the end, what does it mean to be a strategic thinker? It means extending the shadow of the future. It means pushing our horizon out. To broaden our sense of what that can mean, let's briefly consider one more figure. Someone whose career suggests additional features about strategic living. Features that may play an even larger role in the future. Born just a year before Steve Jobs, the media personality and producer Oprah Winfrey has forged a vivid personal brand and self-improvement mission that are even more omnivorous than those of the other figures we've considered. Oprah Winfrey's seemingly endless curiosity and her ability to convert even minor details from her personal life into an enduring brand remind us of author and publisher Benjamin Franklin. Oprah Winfrey has relentlessly voiced strategic intent in the mainstream of life's everyday battles. She has inspired millions, perhaps allowing a comparison or contrast with Winston Churchill. And just as Steve Jobs influenced tastes and preferences in technology for perhaps a generation to come, Oprah Winfrey has often shaped and influenced the American national dialogue on everything from books to entertainment, from politics to personal health care. You might regard these particular comparisons as exaggerated, but a strategic personality can thrive in virtually any field. Politics, technology, science, entertainment, and so on. Moreover, consider this. The distance between us in our everyday lives and the greatest strategic minds is rarely as vast as we suppose. Those persons who are bold enough always have new realms for strategic endeavor. There's a quote from a famous poem that I like to recall in my own life as I grapple with the same variables that nettle us all. It isn't the burdens of today that drive men mad, but rather regret over yesterday and the fear of tomorrow. Regret and fear are twin thieves who would rob us of today. This quote from Robert J. Hastings reminds us that it's our attitude towards events that shapes how we deal with them. Strategic thinking skills cultivate an attitude capable of meeting those events. Becoming a strategic thinker means shedding the doubts, the uncertainty. It means mining the past for insight on the present so that we can embrace the future. What we want to be five years from now, ten years from now. This informs what we do today. It tells us how to move our pieces on the great chessboard of life. These are the gifts of strategic thinking, a life without fear of the future a life that is eager for and prepared for challenge, a posture of welcome toward the uncertainty that we all face, and a determination to bend that uncertainty to our own advantage. Recognition that each of us has choices. Determination to never be buffeted by events, but to influence events with our own will, our imagination, 
analysis, planning, and execution. Thinking strategically helps us to impose a bit of order onto a reality that remains stubbornly disorderly. It empowers us to lay down a rudder, to harness the wind, to propel ourselves in our desired direction. The benefits of strategic thinking are many. Increased productivity, work satisfaction, more predictability, less stress, greater efficiency, perhaps more victories than otherwise, and the achievement of our goals more often than not. And while our journey is never free from the caprice of chance and uncertainty, thinking strategically surely makes the ride more enjoyable.